Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the letters to the Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that it that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. My sisters and my brothers, this is the word of the Lord. God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. What do you believe? What do you believe? That's what we're going to be getting at in this series, I Believe, which starts today. We um, are going to be looking at the Apostles' Creed as a guideline for this discussion. And um, the Apostles' Creed is an ancient creed of the church. We're going to be looking into that and what it tells us, what it teaches us about God, um, about God's presence in Jesus, about God's presence through the Holy Spirit. We're going to be examining our, our faith together. We have uh, a book available uh, for sale today out in the, at the Welcome Center, and it is um, Adam Hamilton's book, Creed, and it is a, a good guideline. It walks through the Apostles' Creed. Creed is a word that simply means, I believe. It's from the word credo, I believe. And the Apostles' Creed was a teaching tool. It was something that was not I don't think ever intended to be comprehensive in terms of covering every aspect of our faith, but it was a teaching tool, and it dates back, many people date it back to, to Rome in the fourth century. The Roman church was using the Apostles' Creed as a teaching tool, but uh, other scholars have dug a little deeper, and they found that, that as, as early as the second century, so I mean really early in the life of the, the New Testament church, you have um, in baptismal um, services, this elements of this creed being used. In fact, uh, Lent was a period of, of preparation, intense preparation for those who were converting to Christianity. And during the season of Lent, they would dive down deep into their beliefs and try to understand what it is they believed about God and about His Son Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through the church. And as they, they came to into Easter morning, they would stand before the bishop to be baptized. And the bishop would ask them the question, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? And they would say, I do so believe. 
and they would be baptized down into the water. And then they would say, ask the question, the bishop would ask the question, do you believe in, in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord? And the person being baptized would say, I do so believe. And they would be dipped down into the water. And then the third time, the, the, they would be asked the question, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life? And they would say, I do so believe, and then be baptized into the waters. I'm not the first three-point preacher on the earth. See, there, the Apostles' Creed follows this outline. God as creator, God as Jesus Christ, God as the Holy Spirit, one God known in three ways. We're trying to, to comprehend something that is a mystery. We're trying to comprehend something that we can't have absolute proof of. It's like gravity. How do we know? Well, we experience, as Cheryl was teaching the kids in a beautiful way, that some things we believe that we, we don't have to see to believe because we have experienced. So how do we believe? Why do, you, why do you believe what you believe? What are the convictions that guide your life? And if you believe what you believe, what are the ramifications of that for how you live your life? It's very important that as Christians we wrestle with, with our beliefs and we try to discern what it is God is teaching us and telling us about these things that, that we're trying to understand. And we all have beliefs. We all have convictions. You have convictions. Some of those convictions were shaped in you at an early age. Some of you have very strong political convictions. Others of you have very different strong con political convictions. And sometimes in our country today, we can't even have a civilized conversation between people of differing political uh, beliefs because we hold those so deeply and we're so entrenched in those beliefs, the thought of that another person might have another perspective. And I've, I've thought this for a long time. If everyone would just agree with me, we would have a much better country. I mean, I just think we would, if everyone just held my political opinions, and I find very few people do. We, and I'm, I'm just wrestling because I'm, I'm all over the, I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know. It's frustrating, right? Anybody else? No, 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 don't, don't, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. But you know, you hold convictions and there's a reason you hold convictions. You have experiences that have shaped those convictions. You have uh, teachers who have taught you about those convictions. You've held some of those convictions since childhood. Some of those you've developed through the years. And those convictions are strong. There's a reason you have them. It, it would be nice if we could get to a point where we could, you know, share each with, with each other convictions that we hold in a way that would lead to productive conversation. And if I might humble myself and you might humble yourself as we discuss these things, we might actually learn from one another and it may or may not change what we believe. It may tweak or nuance what we believe. It may not. It may just be something that we listen to and we say, well, that doesn't make sense in my experience, my understanding of things. But, you know, I think in this country we've got to get back to having some, some meaningful conversations and, and not just yell at each other. I think most political debates are just yelling at each other and not really having real conversations. You know, uh, this week with another, yet another mass shooting, it grieves me, you know, it grieves me so deeply, as I know it does you, to see our children affected by this. And, and people have very strong beliefs that they have about what should be done, what's the right answer. Some people believe tighter gun control. Some people believe that's not the answer at all. We need to arm the teachers. Some people believe, you know, it's mental health issues. Some people believe it's a parenting issue. Some people believe it's, it's a societal issue that's deeper than all of this. And it may be a multifaceted issue that, that involves all kinds of different solutions. But, you know, for us just to yell at each other when our children are being gunned down, I mean, to me, it, it, it's, it's time for us to do some repentance. I mean, to change our ways. Repent means to change your ways. And we as a nation are a nation in love with violence. It shows in that almost weekly we've had a mass shooting. At some point, we need to repent, change our ways, and go a different direction. And our children are demanding it. 
and for us to stand here and pray today, you know, I, I, I dread, you know, having to stand before this congregation one more time, one more time to ask you to pray because a tragedy has happened. Children are bit, have been shot, a, a, a mass shooting in Las Vegas, an officer in our own backyard gunned down. There's too much violence. I don't know the answers, but I think it's time for us to quit yelling and start listening and working toward sensible solutions. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But posturing is not the answer. Something must change. You know, convictions lead you to live your life in a different way. If you believe something deeply, if something moves you deeply, it will actually change your behavior. And what we believe about God, it really matters. And I think there's some people that really struggle to believe in God. Um, I'm going to share with you later a struggle in my life where I, I struggled for a period of time to believe in God. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people wonder, what, what is it that we believe how can we know? And I think there's a, there's a human um, element in this that we long at the very core of our being. We long for something more. We long to believe and to know there's something more than just what we can see. Now, we, we have uh, evidence of things that we can see and some of us wonder, is this all there is? You know, do we just live and we go through life and then we die and that's it? Is that all there is? Is there nothing? Or is there something more? I think faith is the quest for that something more. It's, it's a quest to know that there's something more in life. I like what the writer of Hebrews said, he said, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Not seen. What is it you hope for? What's the assurance you're longing for? What is it that you don't see that you really need proof to be convicted of? And what can you trust that you can't see? beyond what we can see? Can you put your trust in something that you can't have tangible proof of? Well, it's a good question, and it's a question that, that we wrestle with. As, as United Methodist Christians, we have tools to help us through this, this search for something more, and we begin with the Bible. The Bible is our primary source of faith. The Bible tells us the story of God and God's love, God's action through Jesus Christ to bring redemption to our world. God's movement through the Holy Spirit to guide us and shape us in life. Scripture's our primary authority of faith. But then there are three other. This is called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral for those who are keeping score at home. Um, the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, John Wesley's framework for how he, he searched through his faith. You begin with Scripture. Scripture's always primary. But then there are three other ways that we... We dive into our faith. One of those is tradition. We look at the tradition of the church for thousands of years and what the tradition of the church has taught us. Our own cultural traditions shape our understanding. Our own family traditions shape our understanding of what it is we believe and how we wrestle with Scripture. Reason, we use our minds. God gave you a brain. One of the things I've I think it's beautiful about being a United Methodist Christian is that you don't have to check your brain when you walk in the door. You know, God gave you a mind for a reason to use it, to probe, to, to question, to study, to go deeper, and to ask questions and, and um, you know, bring scientific inquiry into the process. It's, it's all part of God's gift to us of, of reasonable minds. So we bring reason into the equation. And then experience. 
and we bring our own experience to every situation. And so when we're studying the scriptures, we, we, we're always looking, is this true with my experience? And not just my experience, but the collective experience of the church, of the faith community. Is it true? Does it ring true to my experience? So um, it always begins with scripture and scripture's the primary source. It contains all things necessary for our salvation, we believe but always in conversation with tradition, reason, and experience. Very important for us is to have that framework. That framework helps, helps guide us into our faith. So how do you believe in a God you can't see? When we start the Apostles' Creed and we say those words, I believe, what are we doing? It's, it's really that search for something more. Where's that search taking you? What is it that you believe? I mean, not just the faith that, that maybe that you were taught as a child or what you came to believe as a child if you didn't grow up in a faith community, but right now, what do you believe? What shapes your understanding? What's the bedrock conviction of your life? You know, see, I, I just think we need something more. We need something that holds when life pulls the rug out from under you. You need something that holds you and makes sense. And for me, that's the Christian faith. My own journey in the Christian faith was that I was raised in the church. My father was a pastor. I've always said about my parents that my parents were, were people of such faith that it really didn't matter that my father was the pastor of a church or not. We would have been at church because of my mother. We would have been at church every Sunday. We just would have. It was just part of our lives. I've laughed and kidded about my drug problem in high school. I was drugged to church. Every chance my parents got, I was drugged to church. I mean, I, I really, I, uh, I had, you know, and I loved it. I loved our youth group. I, I was, you know, active in, in, you know, went through confirmation class, was active in our youth group, had wonderful experiences on choir trips and, and, and retreats and, and mission opportunities. And, and really it shaped my understanding. And, and really that, that faith is so important to me, to, to me today that childhood, those childhood experiences of, of being taught the basics of faith at an early age. And I, parents, I just commend you, bring your children to church, even when they're kicking and screaming, okay? Because there's something about the experience that they get it. They, it, it begins to make sense to them. I went to college and, and I, I went through a kind of a crisis of faith in college. It started when I was a sophomore in college in a philosophy class. Anybody ever taken a philosophy class? Mind blown. I mean, I was just, you know, mind blown. I was, and we were going through all these different arguments for the existence of God. And it was, it was fascinating to me and I was really into it. But at the same time, I began to question things about my faith and began to question things about uh, what I'd been taught. And for six weeks at least, I declared myself an atheist. I told my parents they were fools for what they believed. I think the sophomore in college is about the smartest person on earth. <laughs> it's amazing how ignorant my parents were when I was a teenager and into college and how smart they became after I graduated from college. I, I don't know how that worked. But, um, but something, as I, as I probed my faith, I was, I was struggling. And, and trying to make sense of it all. And it's a long story, but, but the short version is I began to look at the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And as I studied the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, to me the story began to resonate with my mind, with my heart, with my soul in a way that was not just a childlike faith, in a way that was beginning to be the beginnings of a grown-up faith. That story of God's love embodied in Christ, God who is not far off and distant, but God who is with us up close and personal, a God who, who walks with us and talks with us and teaches us the way that leads to life, that made sense. His death on a cross for my sins and for yours uh, connected me with the suffering of a God who suffers with us, 
who longs for us to know the depths of his love and the resurrection of Jesus began to to be bedrock conviction for my life and soul. It was the something more I was looking for. The something more that told me that love never ends. That nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. Not even death. Not even death. For me, it resonated with my being. And it became the conviction of my life. And I began to be able to say, I do so believe. I do so believe. In a way that made sense to me. I mean, not that I didn't believe when I was a child and growing up, but after wrestling with it and throwing it away and, and struggling with it, you know, I really, it really began to make sense for me. So what, what is your something more? What's that something more for you? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. How do we know? If you've come here looking for absolute proof, you may be disappointed. But if you've come here looking for that something more, something that makes sense, something we can't see, but something we can experience as a community of faith, that in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is something more, not just after we die, but right here as we live, there's something more. Maybe this is the beginning for you to say, I do so believe. I do so believe. When my father was dying, uh, people have asked me before, uh, you know, what was, what's your favorite sermon you've ever preached? What's, what's your best sermon or what's your favorite sermon you've ever preached? It's not necessarily for the, these reasons. My father was dying in Houston and um, we were at the hospital and I was scheduled to preach in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta at Salem Campground. It's, uh, some of our members of the church uh, had a connection there and lined me up to preach there. It's the second oldest camp meeting in America. And it's, it was a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal to be invited. If you look at the list of preachers they've asked, I'm like, why'd they ask me? I mean, I, I thought, how did I get invited to this deal? So, you know, it's a big deal. And, and I'm sitting there at the hospital with my father and he's in his last days. And one, one night he woke up and I'm sitting by his bed and he woke up and had a moment of clarity. And he said, I thought you were supposed to be in Atlanta. I said, uh, well, I am. I'm, I'm going over there next week, but I need to be here with you now. One of the last things he ever said to me, boy, you need to get on over there and preach. He died just a few days later, and we had his service. And the day after his service, I'm outside of Atlanta, Georgia, at this wonderful camp meeting, you know, a outdoor with a roof, with sawdust on the ground, pews, wooden pews, benches, and, and uh, choir singing. It's a packed house. It's beautiful. It's an unbelievable setting. And I'm sitting there wondering, why am I here? I mean, they would have understood, right, if I had called in and said, hey, look, my dad died, and I'm, I'm in the midst of grieving. They would have understood, but... Because my father said, you need to get over there and preach, I felt like I should get over there and preach, you know. And um, so I'm, I'm sitting there in the choir singing and beautiful music is, is leading up to the sermon time and I'm just in the throes of it and I'm praying as, as they're singing, I'm praying, Lord, help me. I, I don't really know why I'm here. I don't know that I can do this. And that's when there's something more happened for me. There's something more that spoke to my soul and said, well, do you believe this or not? Do you believe this or not? So I don't know what I said. I could find the sermon, tell you what the outline was. But if you ask me what my favorite sermon was, 
It's, it's when I said, I do believe. Do you believe this or not? And I got up and preached and poured out my soul to those people. You know, um, there's a moment of decision for all of us. There's a moment of decision. Do you believe this or not? There's a choice that we make. Do you believe this or not? Will you put your trust in a God you cannot see? Or do you choose to live with the idea that there's nothing? Nothing more? Nothing more after we die? Nothing. Do you believe this or not? I think it always comes down to that for me. And if we say we believe, it has profound implications for how we live and how we treat one another and how we treat our families and how we act in the world. Belief changes us. It changes how we operate with one another. So, for you this day, is there something more that you're looking for? Have you found that something more that makes sense for your life? And if not, let me invite you into a conversation about the something more I've come to know in Jesus the Christ, the one who is God's love incarnate the one who shows us the way and the truth and the life, the one who opens the door for us to love and forgiveness and understanding. Let me invite you to consider that something more. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to think and to question for the opportunity to have doubts even as part of the community of faith many of us have doubts at times but Lord you are the rock upon which we stand when all else falls away you are our something more You are the one who is the bedrock. We thank you, God, for teaching us. Thank you for opening yourself to us through Jesus. Thank you for guiding us through the Holy Spirit. And we pray that as we go through this series, that each of us may dive deeply into our own hearts and minds, that we may probe and discuss and reflect on what we believe and that we'll be richer for the experience. We pray that uh, you'll bless us all now. In Jesus' name, amen.